Hey, everyone. This is Laura Adams. I'm the host of Money Girl. I've been hosting the show since 2008. And the mission here is to help you live rich and love the journey. I'm really glad to have you with me. And today's topic is going to be related to investing. We're going to talk about stocks in particular. This is a topic that can really be a head scratcher for a lot of investors, particularly new investors. I think the stock market can seem a little mysterious. It can be certainly intimidating. Many people hear that stocks are risky and At the same time, they know that they have potentially higher returns. So it's kind of like this push and pull. You want those high returns, but yet you don't want the risk. I think that can be confusing. So this podcast is going to break it down. We'll explain how to invest in stocks when you have little experience, you've got little money. We're going to talk about the pros and the cons and the best ways that you can own stocks, but also be safe. You can build wealth safely, and I'm going to give you some really key, easy shortcuts to know how to buy stocks, how much you should buy in your portfolio. So stick with me. Uh, If this is a topic that you're interested in, if you're looking to build wealth using the stock market, and I think everybody should be, I hope you'll stick with me. You're going to find the notes for each show and the full archive of podcasts in the Money Girl section at quickanddirtytips.com. This is episode number 649 called A Beginner's Guide to Investing in Stocks. So let's zoom out and just talk about what stocks are in the first place. Stocks are intangible. There's something that you buy that you can't see. They give you ownership in a company. So you're also going to hear them called equities or equity investments. Owning stock, even just one share of stock, entitles you to a part of the company. It could be a part of their earnings or a part of their assets. And companies issue stock basically just to raise money. They want to get money from investors and they could use it for a variety of things. You know, maybe they're looking to do some some research. Maybe they need to open a new division, hire a crew of talented people. Uh, They're looking for money for a variety of reasons. And publicly traded stocks are bought and sold on exchanges. You've probably heard of the NASDAQ. You might have heard of the New York Stock Exchange. These are some of the major places where stocks are bought and sold. However, you can only trade them through a broker or an investment firm. There's a, a you know kind of an intermediary that you have to go through to buy and sell stocks. And when a stock increases in value, it's called capital appreciation. And that's a fancy way of saying that the price goes up. It appreciates. And that's what we all hope will happen with our stocks. And, you know, as I'm writing this episode, I was looking at a few prices of stocks. Facebook and Apple are selling on the NASDAQ. And Facebook right now is selling at over $266 a share. Apple is selling at over 469 bucks a share. Visa and Walt Disney are on the New York Stock Exchange. Visa is selling for 202, a little over 202, and Disney is selling for uh, close to $128. And of course, these values can change rapidly, but right now, that's where they are. So let's say you buy Visa at $202 a share, and then the price goes up to $210 a share. You can sell it for a gain of $8. That's capital appreciation. That's how, that's one way that we can make money on uh, the purchase of stocks. You can find current stock price quotes at a lot of different places. Google Finance has a great place, Yahoo Finance. You can just type in the name of any company or stock that you want to see, and you'll see that stock's price and the history. In addition to the price going up or capital appreciation, some stocks also pay a portion of company profits. If they do, it's called a dividend stock, and they distribute dividend payments to shareholders. For instance, right now, Discover is paying a dividend of 44 cents a share. So if you own 1,000 shares of Discover, you would be paid $440 in dividends over a year. So that's another way that some stocks uh, help you make money. 
Dividend stocks pay you even when the share price goes down. So owning them is a smart hedge against potential market losses. And you can find a list of dividend stocks on a site like Morningstar. That's a a great place to do some research on different types of stocks. But before you buy stocks, you really need to understand the pros and the cons. There are many advantages to investing in stocks. One of them is that you don't need a whole lot of money to buy them compared to other assets like real estate, where you typically need a really big down payment. With a stock, you can just buy one share and it you know, might be a, a dollar or it might be $100. It just depends on, on what the stock is. Buying just one stock share makes you an instant business owner without investing your life savings or having to take on significant risk. Another advantage of making stock investments is that they offer the most potential for growth. Although there's no guarantee that every stock will increase in value, since the mid-1920s, the average large company stock has returned about 10% a year. So that's a pretty good track record. If you're investing for a long-term goal, such as retirement or maybe an education for a young child, stocks can really turbocharge your portfolio and give you that growth that you need to achieve the goal. Over the long term, no other type of common investment performs better than stocks. Now, the main disadvantage of investing in stocks is that Prices can be volatile. They can spike up or they can plummet quickly as trading volume fluctuates. And that's, this is happening literally from minute to minute. News, earnings, forecasts, quarterly financial statements, all these things are triggers that can cause investors to buy or sell shares. And that activity throughout the day is what influences a stock's price. Price volatility is the reason that stocks are one of the riskiest investments to own in the short term. Investing at the wrong time could wipe out your portfolio or cause you to lose money if you need to sell shares on a day when the price is below what you originally paid. But as I mentioned, you can minimize this risk, although you can never eliminate it completely by adopting a long-term investing strategy. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. So in addition to taking a long-term approach, another key strategy for making money investing in stocks is called diversification. This means that you've got many stocks in your portfolio. You don't own just one. I do not recommend you try to pick individual stocks. It's kind of like gambling. Unless you really have a lot of information, you know, you do it for a living, it's really difficult to pick winning or losing stocks. But when you have a diversified portfolio, it really smooths out the risk. And a lot of people are surprised to learn that it's better to own more investments or more stocks than less. Diversification allows you to earn higher average returns while reducing your risk because it's not likely that all of your investments would drop in value at the same time. For instance, let's say you put your life savings into one technology stock and it tanks, you're in trouble. But if that stock only makes up a fraction of your overall portfolio, the loss will be negligible. So having a mix of investments that respond to market conditions in different ways is the key to smoothing out risk. Diversification isn't a guarantee that you're going to make a killing with your investments, but the idea is that as some investments go up in value, Others may decline and vice versa. Having a diversified portfolio prevents you from, quote unquote, putting all your eggs in one basket, as they say. So how do you do that with stocks? How do you own lots of stocks instead of just one or two? Well, I want to put you at ease because it's really very simple. All you have to do is buy one or maybe a few stock funds Buying funds is the way to go. This is a very simple, inexpensive, and convenient way to achieve instant diversification. Funds bundle investments. It could be a bundle of stocks, bonds, assets, or other securities into packages that are convenient to buy, and they're made up of many underlying investments. Some funds may focus just on one asset class only, such as international stocks or domestic stocks. Others could have a mix of asset types. They might have uh, part bonds, part stocks, part cash. 
there are a variety of fund types that you may see depending on the investment firm you use. I'm going to review a few of them here. You've probably heard the term mutual funds. These are very common. They are collections of assets that are managed by a fund professional, and they give you a really simple way to own a portfolio of many stocks. Shares can be bought or sold only at the end of the trading day when the fund's net value gets calculated. So there's a little bit of a delay with mutual funds. You're not buying and selling instantly like you are with another type of fund that I'm going to tell you about in a moment, but the value is calculated at the end of the trading day. So the other type that you've probably heard of is an exchange-traded fund, or ETF. These are similar to mutual funds because they're baskets of assets, but they trade like an individual stock on an exchange, and so they're experiencing price changes throughout the day. You've probably heard of index funds. These are a type of mutual fund that have a goal of matching or outperforming a particular index, such as the S&P 500. And index funds typically come with very low fees, and they may be made up of thousands of underlying assets. So index funds are a great choice. Target date funds are another type of fund you may see on your menu of options. These are a type of mutual fund that automatically reset the mix of the investment. So like the mix of stocks, bonds, and cash, according to a time frame that you select. And typically, it's your retirement date. So the target fund name might be something like target date, you know, 2050, some date in the future when you plan to retire or take start taking money out of the fund. Target date funds are a newer type of fund, but they do a lot of automatic rebalancing for you. And so that can make it really convenient to own. Uh, you'll probably see those on a menu of investment options as well. So what I'm telling you is that stock funds should be an essential part of your long-term portfolio, not individual stocks. If you're young and you've got a long way to go before retirement, I would consider owning a large percentage of stock funds. Although the prices will go up and down in the short term, you're likely to see prices trend up over time, and that's going to give you an impressive return. So a lot of people have asked me, well, Laura, right now with everything going on with the pandemic, there's so much volatility in the market, should I just stop investing? And my answer is always no. There will always be volatility in the stock market. You know, no matter what's going on, there's going to be volatility. The idea is that you're going to ride those up and down waves over time so that you are trending up ever so slightly over time. You're going to go down, you're going to go up, but over time, that trend line is going up and to the right. So, If you've got plenty of time, that's going to work to your advantage. But again, that's not going to work to your advantage if you're trying to invest in the short term. So stocks are a long-term play. And if you're nearing or you're already in retirement, you want to take a more conservative approach to preserve your wealth. And that does not mean eliminating stocks completely from your portfolio. It just means that you want to own a lower percentage of stocks. And I'm going to give you a rough rule of thumb to use when you're trying to figure out how much stock you should own. The rule of thumb says you should subtract your age from the number 100 or even from 110. And that number is the percentage of stocks you should own. So let's say you're 40 years old, you would consider holding either 60% or maybe up to 70% of your investment portfolio in stocks. Now, if you are super aggressive and you've got a lot of tolerance for risk, you might go 80% or 90%. It really is up to your individual risk tolerance. So this rule of thumb is just kind of kind of a middle of the road way to think about it. And then the remainder of your portfolio would be in other types of assets. So things like bonds, real estate, and cash. Again, these investment allocation targets are not hard rules because everyone is different. Everyone feels very different about taking risk with their money. What's important to remember about making money with stocks is that the amount you own should change over time. When you have decades to go before retirement, 
you want to take advantage of as much growth as possible by investing the majority of your portfolio in stock funds. But as you get closer to retirement, you want to devote more of your portfolio to bonds and cash, which preserve the wealth you've worked so hard to accumulate. I hope that's been helpful to give you a primer on stocks and some ideas about pros and cons and how much you should have. If you've got a money question or a dilemma related to investing, I would love to hear it. One way to do that is to email me a question at lauradadams.com. Another is to join a conversation that's going on at a terrific community, which is my private Facebook group called Dominate Your Dollars. There's some really great people helping each other asking really smart questions, and I'd love you to be a part of it. To request your invitation, all you have to do is visit Dominate Your Dollars on Facebook, or you can send me a text message for immediate access. Just text the word DOLLARS, D-O-L-L-A-R-S, to the number 33444. I hope to see you in the group. And I'd also love to get your voicemail message. We have a dedicated line just for you. You can call 302-364-0308 to leave your message 24-7. That's all for now. I'll talk to you next week. Until then, here's to living a richer life. Money Girl is produced by the audio wizard Steve Rickyberg with editorial support from Karen Hertzberg. If you've been enjoying the podcast, take a moment to rate and review it on Apple Podcasts. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes that are always available at quickanddirtytips.com. 